morning church welcome to our worship service for the Anlo Valley Church AB Reach glad that you're with us and we pray that uh, you're blessed by our time together this morning thank you for investing in this time thank you for worshiping God and may we do so with all our heart there's a great passage that I want to begin with here in Psalm 84 verse 10 we sing this psalm often better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. The psalmist expresses his desire to be at church, to be in the presence of God, to go to the temple, to honor God, to worship God. And I know that's why you're here this morning, because you want to worship God. You do believe that it's better to be in God's kingdom than it is to be in, out in the world and uh, not a part of the discipleship of Jesus. And so, welcome. It's great to have you this morning. I'll say a, a prayer to bless our service, and then I have a few announcements that I want to share with you. Bow with me, if you will. God and Father, thank you for this morning. Father, we do long for your presence, long to fellowship with you and to commune with you and to be connected to you. And so we pray that your spirit would be kindled within each one of us as Christians so we know that you're with us and that we feel your comfort and we feel your power. We pray that you would strengthen us this morning and as we worship you that we would be revived spiritually so that we can go into the world and be bright lights for you and to shine 
uh, in a way that uh, reflects your glory and your goodness. And Father, help us to strive every day to be like Jesus. We want to be like our hero. We want to be true Christians. We want to be Christ-like. And so, Father, help us to do that. Forgive us of our sins. And Father, bless us to be your people and bless this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, some good things going on. Uh, we're going to uh, be having a walkathon, parking lot sale, and car wash all at the same time on uh, June 5th here at the building, beginning about uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. The college students and the teens will be washing cars. Then those of you that uh, want to do a garage sale here at the building in the parking lot, we'll have plenty of people coming in, getting their cars washed. And so uh, you'll be able to uh, sell some of the things that uh, you need to get rid of and that you're not using at your home and hopefully be able to raise some money for the special contribution. And also we'll be uh, walking from here to the here at the building to uh, George Lane Park and back as uh, that's our usual course. And so we'll be doing all three on uh, that day of June 15th. And uh, we had a great uh, worship services last Sunday with uh, uh, Landon Rawson and Gina, and they uh, shared some great things from uh, Copenhagen and the Baltic Nordic region of the world. And uh, I really helped us to prepare our hearts and minds for the special contribution. And, and uh, Gina said something that stuck in my mind. She said, it doesn't matter how many people we uh, save because that's God's work. But uh, we gave out thousands upon thousands of invitations to church and to study the Bible. And that's why they're there. And that's what we're supporting. And so we'll be giving our contribution on June 13th. And it'll be a 13 times $100,000 is our goal. And uh, we've already raised $22,000. Uh, $516 with 21 donors. And uh, so we're about 20% there towards our goal for our contribution. And so let's have a great worship service this morning as uh, we continue in song. You are good, you're good, oh. 
now You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Good morning, everyone. It is time for communion. And um, I want to share that these uh, last two weeks have been filled with such a great celebration in my family. Our oldest daughter, Mandy, gave birth to a new little baby girl on May 13th. Her name is Kensington Jane. And, um, you know, she's such a blessing. She's really a tiny little miracle, as all babies are. Um, she's been a great, great blessing to our lives and just a true source of joy for all of us. Um, so new birth has been on my mind a lot. And in light of that, I thought of this uh, verse for communion today. In 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So new birth is, is my theme for today. And, you know, as, as Kensington uh, begins her new life, uh, you know, our in our family, our main topic of conversation has been, um, well, who does she look like? And we've decided, you know, from the nose up, she looks like mom. And from the nose down, she looks like dad. So we're like, how's that going to be beautiful? <laughs> but, you know, it will be. Uh, God has an amazing, amazing way of in his creation of combining, you know, qualities from moms and dads and and, uh, and children just are, are uh, combinations of, of all these uh, genes that they've inherited. But, you know, that's been our talk. Uh, what kind of personality will she have? Will she be easy and flexible or will she be difficult and fussy? Um, what will she be when she grows up? You know, will she be um, a nurse, an attorney like her mom? Will she be president of the United States? You know, we just, we have the greatest hopes for her life. And, um, you know, it's it's the same with us, with, with those things in mind. 
about uh, Kensington. You know, this verse reminds me that we also, all of us, um, are born again. Just, you know, whenever we were baptized, we were born again. We God gave us a chance to start all over, to live a new life. It's such an amazing, amazing gift from God. And, uh, you know, God wants us to have a happy life, a fulfilled life. He's our Father, and uh, He wants us to live each day in a living hope that we can be resurrected just like Jesus was, that we can live in heaven with God someday. And so just as, you know, we, uh, with our granddaughter, Kenzie, we're aware of the inheritance that she's received from her mom and dad, um, not just looks, but personality, but not just those things, the inheritance she's received from them in terms of, that she will receive in terms of just their love, their protection, their teaching. You know, we also, like this scripture says, we have an inheritance from God that will never perish, spoil, or fade. We have so many amazing spiritual blessings from God, everything we need to live in this life and to live happy, successful lives. Um, and, and God not only... Um, gives us that, those lives, but he also gives us his power. He shields us with his power to protect us um, until we're in heaven with him. He's just taken such great care of us, um, all because Jesus was willing to come to earth, willing to die for us on the cross and resurrected again. So let us pray and let's show God our respect, our gratitude for that through prayer. God, we thank you so much for um, our new our new birth, our new lives. Thank you so much that uh, you wanted those those lives for us, a happy life, a contented life, a successful life. Uh, thank you so much for that gift and that you give us your power to shield us, that we have all your spiritual blessings uh, for an inheritance. Uh, Father, we do long to be with you in heaven, and we look forward to that someday. We just thank you for these gifts, uh, uh, what we have to look forward to in heaven, and thank you so much for Jesus on the cross, what he went through for us to make it possible. In his name we pray. Amen. It's time for our contribution, and later on in this chapter in First Peter, or later on in the book of First Peter, chapter four, verse um, verse eight, it says, "Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins." We could stop right there because that's just an amazing promise. Love covers over a multitude of sins. We need that. Um, but it says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. 
If anyone speaks, um, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I love the book of Peter. This is my, uh, this first Peter, it's my favorite book in the Bible. Um, There's just... All these verses are so power-packed, we could just spend so much time on each one. But again, what stands out to me is how the kind of lives that God wants us to live. He wants us to uh, love each other deeply. And He loves us so that we can be filled with His love, so that we can turn around and love each other deeply. God provides us with hospitality so that we can in turn offer hospitality to others. He gives us gifts to use. We all have gifts from God, um, whether it's speaking, serving. Uh, he gives us his word so we know what to speak. Just so many, so many ways God has taken care of us um, and provided us with the tools and the gifts to live the kind of lives that he wants us to live. So as we think about contributing and giving and serving other people that are less fortunate than we are. Um, Let's just think about all that God has provided for us. And again, um, let's pray for contribution and just express that gratitude to God. Father, we are so thankful for uh, your many, many gifts to us. Um, Help us use those gifts to encourage other people, to benefit other people, and um, help us to always be aware of the love you filled us with, the, the gifts that you've given us, and use those accordingly. Help us to be faithful stewards of all you've given us. And um, as we contribute this, uh, this morning, help our hearts to be right and our minds to be at peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, turn, turn your Bibles over to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to look at the, the woman from Babylon, the seducer of God's people. The harlot of Babylon is how she's described in this chapter. And uh, 
this uh, picture of this uh, uh, seductive woman is symbolic of uh, corruption, uh, symbolic of political uh, corruption, and trying to cause people to be unfaithful. And so the key word of uh, Revelation chapter 17 is harlot. And uh, it's the, the chapter of the great prostitute of the book of Revolution, Revelation. And she seduces God's people away from God. This woman rides on a beast from the sea, which is symbolized by corrupt political powers. There's a lot of politics dividing our people and dividing Christians and hurting and straining church relations. And so be on your guard that you don't embrace the power of the world, a political power that causes you to drift away from God and to oppose other Christians. The profane prostitute sits or resides on many waters, meaning many governments. And invoking the name of Christ summons divine power, but blaspheming or profaning the name of Christ mocks the deity of God. And the woman does that here in this chapter. So let's begin in verse 1, and let's read together. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. That term, the great prostitute, is a symbol of the seducer of sin who entices people from faithfulness to God. Judgment will bring a devastating end to the practices of those that lead other people astray. That is one thing that Christ will not forgive, leading other people into sin, false teaching, leading other people to uh, be unfaithful to God. Spiritual adultery for Christians is not being faithful to our vow that Jesus is Lord. We made a vow where Christ would be the master and Lord of our lives. And that means that he directs our lives. He guides our lives. We listen to him. We obey his commands. We imitate him. And when we're unfaithful to that vow, then we're committing spiritual adultery. And that is the goal of Satan. That is the goal of this great prostitute of Babylon. Revelation 17 and verse 2 says, With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. This is symbolic language. What are these adulteries that uh, is being described? This seducer of sin conspires with corrupt leaders of nations and attracts sinners with the intoxication of rebellion. A rebellion and breaking covenants it illustrated by the word adulteries. God has rules. God has covenants. God has a contract with us. God has given us commands. And when we rebel and we throw that off, as most of the world has done, then we're committing spiritual adultery. Adultery in marriage is breaking of our marital vows, the marriage covenant. And so spiritual adultery is breaking our vows to God and rejecting his covenant, the the New Testament. The woman rides on political corruption as her means to influence the world. Verse 3 of Revelation chapter 17 says, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and seven horns. The picture of this profane prostitute is of a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. The scarlet swine resembles the Leviathan with seven heads and ten horns, which is supposed to be a parody of the slain lamb of God who offered himself on the throne of God and the, sac the altar of God for the sacrifice of our sins. This burgundy beast is covered with blasphemous names to mock the sacred titles of the divine trinity. The profaning of the name of Yahweh is blasphemy. And so when uh, people curse and use God's name in vain so casually, so with such a, a, a cavalier attitude that uh, they don't realize the invoking of the name of God in any way is a blasphemous thing to do. Revelation 17 and verse 14 says, The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and with glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand and filled it was filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. 
So this profane prostitute dresses with the finery of uh, the seductress with bright, rich colors and flashy jewelry. The, the fortunes of sin does amass worldly wealth often. So this, uh, the girl, the gold and, and pearls and precious stones were gained through abominations and adultery is the symbology here. Revelation personifies evil as a prosperous, prosperous party prostitute who uses golden goblets that are filled with filth and sin and all kinds of debauchery and abominations. In verse 5 of Revelation, it uh, goes on to say, <clears throat> The name of our master is on our foreheads throughout the book of Revelation. The profane prostitute's title sounds like the credits of a porn star. Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Some sinners have no shame as they flaunt their practices and debaucheries. And this babe of Babylon claims authorships of illicit sex and pornography and, and immorality and ungodly abominations. Profanity, cursing, and blasphemy is the language of the ungodly and the ignorant and the uninformed. So imagine the corrupt connotations that filled her goblet. And this is this is just illustrative language to help us to realize the pervasiveness of evil that's around us and how strong we need to be spiritually and how we need to avoid these things and not be seduced. Just as Samson was seduced by Delilah, there's this constant spiritual force of evil out there trying to seduce us. Seduces as men, seduces as women to commit sins and to be unfaithful to God. Revelation 17 and verse 6 says, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those whose testimony is born to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. To add insult to injury, the scarlet seducer is drunk with the blood of saints. Evil is intoxicated by the pain, suffering, and death of godly people. Can you imagine? The personification of impurity feasts on the blood of martyrs. And John is shocked by this blasphemy of this Babylonian babe, this prostitute of evil. And in verse 17, then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So this divine tour guide, this angel from heaven, was a little bit shocked that John was uh, so put back, put uh, so astonished, so surprised by uh, the evil of this woman. And, you know, sometimes we go through life and we don't see behind the spiritual bell. We don't see all that evil. We just see what we want to see. And so this heavenly host witnesses Satan's seductions daily. But humans, we don't always see behind the veil. In verse 8, it says, The beast which you saw once was, not is now, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. And that language of the beast was once, now is not, and yet will be to come, is sort of parody to what was described of Jesus. Jesus was and is and will be. That's what it's said of Christ over and over in this book. And so the beast claims the same power as Jesus. The Antichrist claims the same power as the Christ. So the beast is a parody of Christ claiming life, death, and resurrection. Once was, now is not, and yet is to come out of the abyss. But the end of the beast is destruction, whereas the end of Christ is is resurrection and new life, being born in, into heaven, into eternal life. Revelation 17 and verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So the angelic announcer 
This narrator from heaven explains this symbolic vision for a mind of wisdom, wisdom implying we need to, need to have spiritual discernment to understand this book. Babylon is code for Rome. They don't come right out and say Rome. They say Babylon because they, they want to live a little longer. They want to save a few more souls. And so they're not going to explicitly attack the ruling power and the government. But they're using symbolic apocalyptic language to represent Rome. Babylon represents all cities full of sin and corruption that draw people away from God. The Antichrist deceives the world with the promise of death, burial, and resurrection. But due to the purity of Jesus, Christ destroys evil and destroys death. And so the beast ends in destruction. In Revelation 17 and verse 10, it says, they are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. So this passage describes these seven kings that represent the corrupt, ungodly leaders who have conspired against God and have sold their souls to the devil. The sixth are symbolically one short of the total number is currently reigning. Eventually, the last leader will arrive, but only for a short time before their destruction and their judgment. Verse 11, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction, says the angel. So the Antichrist is the eighth king who is the burgundy beast. This scarlet Satan arrives to claim his authority only to be, be destroyed by Christ. The eighth king symbolizes the evil emperor of the evil empire. So in verse 12, John writes to us, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. So uh, in, the, in the end of times, there'll be political leaders, ten being a complete number, who will represent the co-conspirators with this harlot or antichrist serving the beast. So in verse 13, he goes on to say, they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. So these con corrupt conspirators of the beast use their political power to oppose God's kingdom and to oppose Christians. Well, there's a lot of political power persecuting Christians around the globe. There's a lot of political power that is trying to suppress Christianity and not let it have an influence in the world today. Putrid politicians have one purpose, and that is to destroy the faith of Christians. And they're working for the beast. Revelation 17 and verse 14. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them. Because why? He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called and chosen and faithful followers. That's you and me. So we're going to triumph over these evil political powers, the scarlet beast, the Babylonian prostitute. Christians experience a barrage of political pressure to compromise Christian orthodoxy. But the lighthouse lamb is unconquerable as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So we as disciples are called to be victorious, to overcome. We're invited by Jesus. We are chosen and we're destined by Christ to be victorious. And we are cohorts or followers with Jesus in this spiritual battle that we will win, but we are in the midst of. In Revelation 17 and verse 15, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So people from all over the globe. The angel reminds John that the pagan prostitute influences the entire global community of nations with false teaching, with blasphemies and lies. Evil is pervasive, as pervasive as water. And so often we don't believe that, but unfortunately it's true. Revelation 17 and verse 16 says, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked and they will eat her flesh and burn her 
with fire. So evil eventually turns on itself. Rome fell from the corruption within. Every evil politician falls from their own consequence of sin. And there is no honor among thieves or polluted politicians. So it's these Corrupt conspirators eventually turn on the woman, on the beast, and God conquers them, and then God judges those uh, corrupt politicians as well. So in Revelation 17 and verse 17, it says, For God has put it on their hearts to accomplish what? His purpose. So God uses people as he will, especially when they've given themselves over to the beast, by agreeing to hand over the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. God is sovereign and his will will be done in this world. At the point of time in history, the sovereignty of God allows sinful states, statesmen to rise to power who will conspire with the Antichrist before his destruction. But then the satanic serpent believes he can wage war against God and the heavenly hosts to achieve a different outcome, but the outcome is already determined. God wins this spiritual battle for us. In Revelation 17, verse 18, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So there's, there's always going to be some evil superpower that threatens the world, that's constantly trying to seduce faithful people, orthodox people, away from God, and God ultimately destroys them. The angel clearly explains that the harlot is Rome, the great city of the empire, and sinners suffer from self-deception, but the lamb will destroy this beast. So, several lessons we learned this morning. Several great thoughts, profound truths from Revelation chapter 17. The first is those who lead others astray are seducers of sin and they will be punished. As we've seen throughout the book of Revelation, there is consequence for sin. There is good and evil in the world and there is a spiritual battle and God will end that battle eventually. Spiritual adultery is the breaking of God's covenant with his people. This is one thing we don't do. We are faithful to our vow. We're faithful to God. We're faithful to the covenant. The Christian vow is Jesus is the Lord, and it must be fulfilled. Jesus must be the Lord of your life. If he's not the Lord of your life, he's not Lord at all in your life. So he must be Lord of all, or he won't be in your life at all. The world seduces Christians through pleasure and false teaching. That's why this seductress is a prostitute, a woman that drinks of the blood of faithful martyrs, a woman who, who uses lies and deception and enticement into adultery and, and sin and immorality and all kinds of illicit activity. The Babylonian prostitute represents profane and secular governments. The scarlet Satan of the evil empire will be defeated. Again, we're reminded by the Lamb of God. And the faithful followers of God will not be seduced by this satanic serpent. Brothers and sisters, Revelation is a book of uh, incredible imagery, but it's to call us to be faithful to the end, to persevere in our faith, to not be seduced by evil, but to be committed to our vows as Christians, committed to the word of God and the covenant of God. And may God fill us with strength and energy this next week and for the rest of our lives to be faithful followers and overcome with the, with the King of Kings and with the Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God. God bless you, church. Amen.
Rubina Gaba. I am graduating from Quetzal High School. I am going to ABC and CSUN. My major is going to be American Sign Language and uh, Photography. Hi, V Church. It's Denisha Wolfolk here. I just wanted to say that I am graduating. Well, I graduated from P9 High School and I'm going to be going to Bakersfield College. And my major is going to be in theater. I just recently changed it. I'm really excited. And thank you so much. Hi, my name is Morgan Cook. I graduated class of 2020 with Elite Academy. I'm currently enrolled in College of the Canyons as my major in theater, and in the near future, I hope to enroll into Fullerton. Valley College with an AS degree in Biological Sciences. I will be going to CSUN in the fall for a bachelor's in chemistry so that I can work for forensic science. Hi, my name is Milena Hernandez. I recently just graduated from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in downtown Los Angeles. I currently work at Stoneflowers Apparel in Chatsworth, California. And I really just plan to further my experience there and eventually grow further into the fashion industry. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Blanco. I recently just graduated from Antelope Valley College, where I majored in sociology. My plans for the future would have to be to either become a teacher or a counselor. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Shani Monroy. I graduated from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise. My major is beauty, product development, and marketing. And my future goals is to expand my small business of cosmetics uh, with my sister um, to expand it. and hopefully work at a major beauty brand or Vogue for their social media marketing.
Hello, my beloved AV Church. I'm so excited that I just earned my master's degree in missional theology and leadership from Rochester University. This is a dream come true for me as I started back to school in 1995 to take an Old Testament survey class in Chicago. And then God called me to drop everything and move to the Antelope Valley. I've never regretted answering God's call to move here. It has been my privilege to serve in this church for 26 years and to get married here and to raise my family here. In my master's program, I experienced a lot of personal and spiritual growth, but the driving force in my decision to get this degree was that I saw it was an investment that I was making in my church that I love so dearly. I want to continue to share what I've learned with you, and I'm looking forward to working together with you and the church leadership for the spiritual growth and development of every member of our church and our community. Most of all, I want to thank the Lord for, for providing the opportunity to fulfill one of my kingdom dreams. And I want to thank my husband and my kids, Glenn, Kobe, and Wesley, for all their support and sacrifice during my schooling. Love you, AV Church.